Over the years, Jamie and I have identified certain things that increase our anxiety, uh, increase our anxiety, and have worked to manage them the best that we can. A few years into our marriage, we became to the conclusion that the more cluttered our living space was, that the less relaxed we became at home and the higher in our anxiety. Little things became big things, and it isn't that our house is a disaster. We actually keep a fairly tidy house. It's just that little things that ended up becoming much larger, like papers that sat on desks and didn't get recycled or filed, or maybe the shoes that began to spill out into the closet, or maybe uh, people with kids don't have this problem, but our kids seem to like leave toys out right? Uh, and that gets to be cluttered and they don't get to be in the designated places. Now, when these little things became part of the bigger things, it created this chaos inside of our lives. And so we sat down together to discuss how to tackle these little things so that they wouldn't become overwhelming. And the more attentive we become to this, the more aware we are that how we organize the space around us impacts us in very deep ways. Now I start with this story because the first story of the Bible starts with chaos. Now the Hebrew word for this that's used in our scripture is tohu wabohu. Now it's a fun word to say, tohu wabohu, but it's actually very difficult to translate for our modern English. You can look at multiple different translations and get a plethora of words. So for example, it carries the meaning of things like chaos, Darkness, waste, confusion, desert, emptiness, vanity, formless, and void. And regardless of what words we use, we utilize the idea is that this is a suffocating, uncontrollable, dark place that has no form. And it is here where God's Spirit dwells. It is here that is the beginning point for the dividing and organizing to create life out of this chaos. Now, the whole first chapter of the Bible is God dividing those spaces and then filling those spaces with life and declaring them good. Now, the creation story in and of itself is deep and multifaceted, but I want to focus on one particular area, which is near the end of the creation story in which God makes humans and then gives them power over God's creation. Now, it's another difficult Hebrew word to interpret, but normally we translate it into something that demonstrates the ability to have control or power or dominion over the creation. Now, what is traditionally thought is that God has this immense power to alter and create worlds, and then God takes that power and he hands it over to humans in order to have that ability to create themselves. One of the core values of God is empowering others. And from the beginning, it is evident that God gives humanity this incredible gift to create worlds and tend for our creations. And it is this powerful, awe-inspiring moment in which humans have been entrusted with care over something so precious, something so good, something so teeming with life. Yet, when we look at the world around us, we often notice that we haven't taken care of it or have been utilizing our power and authority that we've been given to actually take care of the world properly. One of the things I love about working with college students, it is that is in their place where they have been empowered to create their own life. In high school, your schedule is dictated. It's dictated by parents, it's dictated by the high school, it's dictated by your work schedule, it's dictated by your activities. But when you get into college, you are handed this immense amount of freedom. You get to choose when your classes start, you get to choose which classes you're taking, you get to choose when you want to eat, what food you want to eat, what activities you want to be a part of. And most college students are able to make the proper designations and divisions in order to create life. But there are those that struggle 
and there are those that cannot make sense of it and do not make the proper divisions, and their life ends in chaos or disruption. And as an administration and faculty and staff, we look to identify whether students are connected to campus. And there's three basic measurements that we're looking at, and I'm oversimplifying, but the first is are they connecting to classes? Are they in the classroom? Are they attending class? Are they asking questions? Are they talking to the professor? Are they known? The second is are they connecting to the campus? Are they going to different activities? Are they part of the student body? Have they signed up for any clubs or organizations? And third, are they connecting with their peers in the hallway? Do they have friends? Do they go outside their dorm? Are they active in the dorm and the activities that are given? And what we have discovered is that those who are most withdrawn from that community oftentimes are the most likely to end up in chaos or in despair or end up leaving the community. This connecting, this world building, is at the heart of our sustainability message, not only for Christians, but for humans. Disconnection from our world can often lead us into chaos, and the results can be disastrous for both us and the world around us, leading us back to tohohu wabohu. My Old Testament professor, Dr. Bogart, tells of his favorite meal growing up on the farm. He said every few weeks, his mother would make a whole chicken inside of the oven, and she would baste it with butter and herbs and spices, and she would bring it from the oven and set it right on the table in its form, and the children would all fight over which part of that chicken they would get. As he grew up and had children of his own, he wanted to pass along this tradition. So when his son was about four or five, he brought him out to the farm and asked his mom, will you make a whole chicken? And all week long, he'd been hyping this meal up to his son, and his son was so ecstatic. And when the day came, and when they sat down in front, in, around the table, and grandma took that chicken from the oven and put it on the table, the little boy scrunched his nose, stood up, pointed, and said, Ew, that's a chicken. He, even though he'd eaten chicken for a significant portion of his life, he had never made the connection between the animal running around on the ground and the food that he was eating. Many of us in modern day society live in urban environments which are no longer connected to our food source. And not only to our food source, but much of creation that humans were originally empowered to take care of. One day, as I was throwing away some trash, I paused and began to think, where does my trash actually go? Where is it taken? What does it look like? What do they do with it at that other end? Has anyone actually visited the dump to see the process of things being piled up in great mountains of trash? Has anyone stopped to ponder how many resources it takes to keep lights on? Have we seen the manufacturing of windmills, the process of creating solar panels, not to mention the drilling and transportation of fossil fuels? Has anyone experienced the process of industrializing our food, our clothes, our houses, our electronics? My friend John Haran calls the current economic shift creating a frictionless life in which the consumer is so removed from the actual labor to get the things we so desperately desire by pushing our glass screens, and yes, I'm pushing a glass spring because my printer wouldn't work this morning, by pushing our glass screens that things arrive in front of us without any understanding of what it took to actually get it there. And this causes a deep disconnection to the world that surrounds us, but it also carries deep chaos as we are now more disconnected to the world than we ever have been before. And this disconnection is not only with the world, it is a disconnection with community. Our electronic lives have made it more convenient to keep up with people across the nation and across the world Yet oftentimes studies have demonstrated that we are more alone and more isolated than we ever have been before in our lives. 
Now, this sermon is not about turning off your cell phone. It's not about checking out of email. It's not about turning off all the electronics in your life. But it is about becoming more aware that a sustainable way of life is about connecting with the world around us. It has been said that stuff is worthless. It's just stuff. So it doesn't matter. But I wonder if that plays into our consumer lifestyle and makes it easier to toss or throw things away. I often wonder that if we became more attached to what we have, maybe we would be less willing to toss it aside when it got old or out of style. Maybe the solution to a throwaway society is to purchase things that we actually cherish and keep and want to take care of and have a connection to. Our psalm talks about connection. It is an image of a tree whose roots are connected to a living source of water. And in all seasons, that tree has life and produces fruit in abundance. There seems to be a direct correlation between our connection to the world around us, to our community, to ourselves, that allows us to be more rooted, more grounded, to become more aware and more attached. So let's ask a series of questions for ourselves based upon this idea of connection. What would it be like if instead of things becoming disposable, that if they became indispensable to our way of living and we took care of them rather than tossing them out when they became out of fashion? What would it look like to better understand where our food comes from and whether it can be renewed in a manner which brings life to creation? What would it look like to understand that the decisions that we make individually have far-reaching consequences for the global community and that every purchase we make, every product that we lust after, is seen within the resources to make, manufacture, box, ship, have, and dispose of. What kind of habits would change if we knew how much trash that we throw out on a regular basis and where it ends up and what harm it is doing to wherever it goes? A research group was working to restore the watershed of a Midwest river that ran for hundreds of miles across the plains. Alongside this river, there was agriculture, there was manufacturing, there was urban water consumption, there was recreation. But the river had become so polluted that each of these stakeholders had become disgusted and very upset with the way that the river was. Yet, when the researchers went to the individual stakeholders, most of them were not aware or were not willing to listen to what their habits did to the watershed. So the researchers decided to take a different approach. Instead of trying to convince them of each of their wrongdoings, they began to invite them all together to connect with them and to put a face to the other groups of people. And so at these gatherings, you had farmers meeting manufacturers and farmers and manufacturers meeting the urban center residents and those who utilize the river for recreation. And the conversation wasn't about how can we clean up the river. The conversation was about how each of them used the river for their life-sustaining activities. And an amazing thing began to happen. When they began to discuss their issues, they began to see themselves as a larger part of a community connected by this source of water. And it was only then, once they saw themselves as a community, that they could begin to address the issues with the watershed problem. When we think about sustainability, we need to think about the ways in which we have been given power over creation and how we are connected to it and to others. Our actions have consequences. Our actions matter. And not just big items or big actions or big purchases. Even the small actions matter. Purchasing items in season versus out of season matters. Our actions about where our dollars go to which corporations matter. 
Each semester in US history, a class that I teach at Susquehanna University, we learn about the Gilded Age and the abusive employee practices that were delivered upon them by their bosses. But then we connect it to the modern day abuses of many of our industries that have been shipped overseas. And many of the students are astounded to learn of the abuses that many corporations that they use on a daily basis continue to treat their workers like this. And so I asked them the question, would you be willing to pay a little bit more money if you knew that your product was going, was paying someone more? Would you be willing to pay more for a product if you know that those workers were being treated humanely? And every single one of my students are in 100% agreement. yes, we'd be more than willing to pay those things. As Christians and as humans, as part of God's creation who's been empowered with the power to create good and chaos, we need to start seeing ourselves as part of all God's people and creation. And it is only when we are truly connected to God, to ourselves, to others, and creation, that we can truly begin to live sustainably. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.